We'll begin in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to another installment of the Fragments of Silicon Reviews. Um, up this week are two games, and two games you might have actually heard of. I mean, sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't. I'm like, uh, in this case, yeah, it's kind of good fortune, plus I had a uh, hole to fill, mm-hmm. uh, so to speak, in the review schedules. So, here mm-hmm. we are with Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, the rather rare game where we weren't gifted it in some form. No, th- yeah, this review comes from the heart, or at least from the pocketbook for once, for those who actually purchased it. Um, a bit of a note on the footage you're seeing here, this is actually pre-recorded gameplay, um, as apparently Twilight took the time out to record footage for this. Um, guys, why not? And I really enjoyed the game, too. <laughs> indeed. Um, yeah, Petty Fan did not purchase the game because um, he doesn't like Castlevania too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I kickstarted the game, so I have played it. Yeah. I purchased it because, well, we'll, we'll get to the price in a bit, but um, yeah. So, Bloodstain, the Castlevania that isn't Castlevania. Like, I'm pretty sure um, the people who would be listening to this know what Bloodstained is. Um, it's one of the... It's probably... I hesitate to say the most anticipated Kickstarter game out there because Shenmue 3 is a thing, and that mm-hmm. did break the record. But this is probably number two, just on a monetary level. Like, um, Bloodstained is the... Has, you know, is the new Castlevania franchise that can't be called Castlevania because Konami owns that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's being headed up by uh, Koji Igarashi. Like, Who is not the originator of Castlevania, but he is, as it were, the trope codifier of a lot of the parts of Castlevania that people look fondly on. A bit deeper than that, he's considered to be the co- uh, like the co- co-creator, if you will, of the metroidvania genre as it were gets yeah that's mostly what i meant yeah even though how much he actually like worked on castlevania you know even like the ones he oversaw is a um subject of debate let's say but and also he worked on castlevania before symphony of the night it's just symphony of the night is when he took he was in the director's chair right which is uh, an important distinction and what he is working on with the main game, Ritual of the Night, is a game that's going to follow in that um, particular formula. What we got here is um, a stretch goal, basically. Um, mm-hmm. for, um, Galix, you back this, so why don't you inform people of what this is? Okay, this was it was originally one of the original stretch goals for Bloodstained, which Bloodstained ran through its stretch goals, its original stretch goals super fast and had to come up with new ones. One of the original ones was an 8-bit style prequel game, uh, which is, this is what that was. It was actually a pretty high-level stretch goal. Um, but in the production of it, they have decided that instead of being a true prequel game, it's a sort of side story that is like a what-if prequel. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the characters are still clearly before the time of the thing, but the stuff that happens in this game uh, is not necessarily canon to the actual game. Well, it's also worth noting there are multiple endings in this. Right. So yeah. Even if there are, it it's going to be a while before we could discern what the canonical ending would be, because 
Um, well, we know what. Well, we know based on which of the four playable characters in this is the main villain, or the at least the first main villain in Ritual of the Night. We know something about that. Right. I'm just saying. Uh, you know, there are like five endings, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, something like that. Yeah, there are like three major differences, and then there are some minor differences. I'm like. Because, well, because the thing is, you have four uh, recruitable characters in this, but you don't actually have to recruit them, and that is a significant part of where the differences go. Right. Sort of. Like, um, anyway, getting back to the game description, th yeah, this is basically Castlevania 3, as imagined by Igarashi. Like, who was rather a large fan of Castlevania 3. Uh, he's gone on record multiple times stating Castlevania 3 is his favorite Castlevania game of all time. So, and, as, he, as if you couldn't tell by the fact that he puts friggin' Sypha and Trevor in everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, so, of course, he would go to that particular title to draw inspiration from. Like, um, now, is this as good as Castlevania 3? No. No, it's not. Mm. But that's not to detract from the game itself. It's just, you know, this is, this game just got released. And, you know, stacking it up against one of the all-time classics in an all-time classic franchise just is not fair to this game. Mm -hmm. no. And there are, and there, and this game does have some ways in which it is at least more friendly than Castlevania 3 is. Right, but I'm going to I'm going to be up front here. You will be dealing with a lot of um, Castlevania hang-ups. If well, you... Oh yeah. if, 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 if you if you hate fixed jump arcs, you should probably um, yes. shop elsewhere. If you hate <laughs> uh, knockback being a really big problem, uh, there is a mode for that, at least. Yeah, it's like the, yeah, the knockback can be taken care of with the casual mode. That also gets rid of lives. Um... But, yeah, you cannot change the arc of your jump at all, no matter what mode you play. And I know yeah. there are people here where that is just a deal-breaker when it comes to um, playing the Castlevania games. Oh, um, hi. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another difference is your main character is not Miriam, who is your Belmont character. But yeah, we'll Miriam, is, Miriam is the main character of Ritual of the Night, Mm -hmm. She is the first character you unlock in this game, and she is arguably sort of actually the main character. But she is... Uh, She's not... you, you start out as Zangetsu, who is... Uh, he's a guy who really hates demons and stuff. Um, and the thing is that Miriam's power comes from demons being, yeah. like, fused into her body. So in Ritual of the Night, he is a sort of friendly antagonist he's you fight him as a boss the first time you meet him but then he like i think helps you later on sometimes uh, uh in yeah. this zangetsu is your your first main character uh which means that and he fights with a katana and he has sub weapons that are a whip and a couple of other things he has a talisman that is sort of like a holy water and he has a thing that makes him stronger in combat briefly if anything, he plays the closest to Symphony of the Night Alucard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, and he also fucking sucks. Yes. Well, that, there's, a, there's a reason for that, which is I, part of the second ending. It's his range. Yeah, his, he has a really short range. His katana is very short range. He can swing it faster than Miriam can swing her whip. I but know. Yeah, Miriam is the one who, with a, with a higher jump... Uh, with a longer ranged basic attack and with a slide. Yeah, let me just say the most difficult parts of this game weren't anything involved the uh, multiple characters. It's soloing shit with Zengetsu. It's not, and here's the thing. There are um, basically two Zengetsu modes. There's the regular Zengetsu who's, um, well, he's just him. And then there's the powered mm -hmm. up Zengetsu. Here, here's how it works, which is semi-spoilers. Yeah, After might... each of the first... Hang on, hang on, hang on. Petty Fang, you might want to put up a spoiler warning here. Yeah. Because, yeah. 
So oh, yeah, that's a good fair point. Yeah, because yeah, okay. this is yeah, okay. So now so, you may yeah. after after the after each of the first four bosses, uh you come like this is actually on screen just as I'm looking, this which means it happened a little bit ago. You come across one of the other characters, actually the first three bosses. Anyway, uh normally what you'll do is talk to them because that's the button that it indicates to do, and when you do that you recruit them. However, you do have two other choices. One is to just walk and ignore them, and you can proceed as just Zangetsu with his normal stuff. And the other one is you can actually kill them, and then you gain a power. And killing all three of them and completing the game is how you unlock one of the other modes. Ultimate mode. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just completing the game will unlock um, the so-called nightmare mode, Yeah. which is kind of a... It is bullshit because let me tell you it was it's not the easiest mode but it's pretty goddamn easy for something called nightmare mode yeah. yeah but yeah from those you get a slightly better melee weapon arc instead of just being a straight stab it's an arc um you get i think a double jump and a dash attack which makes zangetsu way more uh versatile because his base ability set is not at all hmm <laughs> yeah, he uh, he gets powered up to make him less shit, in my estimation. Um, it doesn't completely remedy because there's nothing that's fixing that range outside of the jump arc, and that's kind of awkward to use because once again, you cannot control your jumps. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, point is, Zengetsu's he's kind of the actual hard mode. Well, Al Alfred Alfred is really hard to deal with when he's alone, but he's the uh, wizard character. He has an even pathetic range and slower attack. Yeah, here's he the thing. He's got the right. He has ridiculously powerful sub weapons. Yeah, it's like he's he's got the magic to back that up. Plus, um, there is like only one segment in the entire game where you have to deal with Alfred alone. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I'm like as opposed to like. Completing the entire game with Zengetsu, which is um, the entire game, um, which I should mention is not very long. Like it's, it'll it's take eight you, stages. Yeah, it'll take you about two to three hours to get through the first time. Mind mm -hmm. you, that's just the first half of the game, because Nightmare Mode that is the actual second half of the game that takes place after the normal ending of the first. Of the rape mode. It's kind of the equivalent of Julius mode. Something along those lines, but not quite. Like nightmare, like nightmare mode does make things harder, but um, you're not going to be dealing with two. Like like the bosses aren't going to have new tactics or new attacks. They're I just they had be, something, just not much. But yeah, may, oh, like um, they're more aggressive, and they uh, take. Yeah. They hit harder and they take more time to kill. It's really cheap. Um, yeah, we can take the spoiler thing down. All right. Um, Oof. Anyway, um, it's really cheap difficulty in my estimation because it's just hey, you're making the enemies hit a bit harder and um, bullet spongier. Yep. Yeah. Outside of, well, the last stage, which is um, a completely new thing. Right. Yeah. And what Ultimate Mode is, is, well, it's you get to have all the characters plus the powered up Zengetsu. Um, if you wish. Th this is probably the mode you want to try to do the game. Uh, you get the ending where you ignore everyone. Because, yeah, trying to do this with uh, normal Zengetsu, that's going to be your hardest challenge. Especially if you're going with veteran mode. Like, though, um, with all that being s said, even though this is an old school looking game, it's not got the old school difficulty. I'm like, no. <laughs> especially once you start to learn the game. Like, I. My second playthrough, I was a lot better at this than my first. Not mm -hmm. right. Like, I think I had, like, 12, 13 lives. Um, That's another yeah, thing. It, it, on one hand, 
you, you don't lose a life until all of the characters you have die. On right. one hand, that potentially gives you a lot of tries before you actually lose all your lives. Uh, the downside of that is that um, some of the characters uh, really help with stage navigation, so not having them until all your other characters die can kind of suck. Right. Especially if you, like, um, sometimes you you might need to kill yourself because there are pathways which can only be accessed by a character. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, uh, Miriam uh, has a lot of these because she can slide. Slide and jump high. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, final playable character is Gebel um, Alucard. He's yeah. He's uh, the main villain of the actual game right. the, of Circle of the Mo or Ritual of the Night. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. There's a reason why uh, Castlevania keeps entering the mind here. Well, several. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yeah. He attacks like Alucard in Castlevania 3. Um, he, throws th he throws three bats. Except, instead of going forward, they move up an arc. He's actually probably he's either the most or second to most useful character because he can hit enemies um, at an angle that you otherwise couldn't hit. Yeah, his, and, and mm -hmm. his sub-weapon is he can fly. Yeah. Uh, that's just it. He can fly and he can um, dash. Like, uh, in fact, like if you hit a blue candle or blue lantern. Yeah, uh, there, there, are, there are blue lanterns that give sub weapons and uh, red lanterns that give generally just magic vials or healing hearts. Right. Um, when G Bell hits a uh, blue lantern, he gets he, uh, magic vials. Yeah. Like, um, anyway, so this game is not very long, but it, it, it's kind of built on replayability. Like, um, yeah, each stage has multiple paths through it, mm -hmm. which like, sometimes you, you, sometimes you might want to try it. It'll always, there's always an indicator of which path is the easiest path. Yeah. And there are you, also, there are also power-ups in each stage. Um, and I will say you will not be able to get them all your first try, mainly because you need um, a, certain characters to get certain power-ups. Well, you can't get them all your first try, potentially, if you play, uh, if you recruit everybody. No, you and... cannot get the power-up in uh, stage one until you get Miriam. Oh, I don't think there is one in stage one. No, there is. Oh, uh, no. There is. It, on normal mode, anyway. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Right. It's like, in order to get all of the power-ups, you need her in stage one, and you and you cannot get that. Um, even if you, like, use the Curse of the Moon power-up, like, the actual thing that the... Uh, yeah, that the, cur the Curse of the Moon is basically... I mean, it is an actual curse that I think Zangetsu has on him, but... Yeah, uh, it's phrased as sometimes your progress will be undone, and what that means is that if you don't like how you how your playthrough has gone, if you changed your mind about what you wanted to do to one of the characters, or you missed a power up, you can revert you can revert the game to that part of the game. Right. Um, anyway, um, in terms of looks, it, you know, it nails the retro aesthetic right down to like the single colored um, characters and. Mm -hmm. And such, like the colored mm -hmm. outlines that make yeah. the characters stand out well. Like, um, there will be some like uh, when it comes to like the bosses. That's when the the illusion kind of breaks. Um, yeah, some of these bosses are higher than eight bit uh, size and detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, you've got the backgrounds. Like, if you had bosses this big in an actual NES game, they would be the background themselves. Right. Which means mm -hmm. you fighting against a black black drop but you know which a lot of games actually did yes I'm like so it's not 100 percent but it's it gets the job done like mm -hmm. nobody's complaining about this not looking like an NES game like or if they are they are very pedantic um, <laughs> music as well um, some high quality chip tunes here Um 
Yeah, I'd say this sounds like it comes out of an NES. Um, once again, it, it's not going to best uh, the Castlevania 3 soundtrack, especially the Japanese one. You know, I, I do wish that they w- would have been able to um, replicate FM sound like uh, the Japanese Castlevania 3. But, you know, whatever. It, um, the soundtrack itself is really good. I'm not sure how to describe it exactly, other than, yeah, th- this is the kind of music you would expect from the action-oriented NES Castlevanias. Like, just a bit different, because, well, there there are no iconic tunes to fall back on. Like, you're not going to get... You're, yeah, you're not going to hear actual Vampire Killer or anything. So... Um... In terms of price, uh, I think it's been mentioned before, but it is ten dollars. I think um, that was in pre-show, but yeah, this this at ten dollars, this is a really good deal. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, um, not sure if it was if it would be worth fifteen or twenty, um, given that it, in terms of content, yeah, it does come across as a side game. It's you know, it's not very long, but that's not something anyone has to worry about. You know, because it is clocking in at ten dollars, um, absolutely perfect price for uh, Curse of the Moon here. Uh, it is I think available. it's worth significantly more, but that's just me. I'm I'm a huge platformer softy, so. Right, I, I get that. I'm just saying, um, even if it was worth more, like it's not. It's at ten dollars, and you know it's not going to ever be more than ten dollars so it's not even uh, you know you can state that but it's not going to be a real consideration mm-hmm. is what i'm saying so um anyway uh this game is available on pretty much every living platform going right now um including the likes of the vita and the 3ds uh mm-hmm. couldn't tell you any sort of compromises that were made to get the... I mean, I'm imagining that this game is the same on those as well, because, well, look at it. Yeah, this yeah. is not a super, super resource-intensive game, or if yeah. it is, then it hides it well. Yeah. That being <laughs> said, I'm going to say that the ultimate portable version is the Switch version. <laughs> Just because, yep. you know, the Switch has a better screen, a bigger screen, that what have you. It's also, you know... You don't have to worry about it not getting games next month. True <laughs> enough, I suppose. Mm, yeah. But um, overall, I would rate Cas- um, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon uh, 8 out of 10. They even but... did a huge C in the in the subtitle. They knew what they yeah. were doing. <laughs> they knew exactly <laughs> what they were doing. Yeah, it, it looks like the, the main Castlevania lo- logo. Like, I'm pretty sure we're not the only reviewers that have had to watch the tongue and not call this fucking Castlevania. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if Castlevania, or if Konami isn't put the Castlevania... The of, isn't that the name of the one, the first, uh... No, it's Circle of the Moon. Yeah, Circle of the Moon was, like, one of the last non-Ega Castlevanias. Like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, here's the thing. Like, Ego didn't have like full control over Castlevania until about the Game Boy Advance era. You know, uh, mm. y- you still had things like Castlevania for the 64 and Circle of the Moon, which uh, were produced by another Konami team. There's a whole history here that we don't have time to get into. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I think we went into that history though, didn't we? Probably it's. We did a Castlevania retrospective, so. Yeah, it's just um, we don't really keep track of what topics we cover for which episode. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe if we had a more robust website, that's a thing we would do. But um, go through our archive and find out, everybody. <laughs> yeah, but it's a fun that, game for everybody. Yeah. Anyway, um, final thoughts on Curse of the Moon. Here. Honestly, that right now it really depends on how well Ritual of the Night does. Because if it's, you know, a total bust, then the views of this game might be different. I, don't I, I still I'm... think this game is almost... I mean, I'm I... going to be disappointed if Ritual of the Night is not good, but uh, this game is almost, like, worth it 
for yeah. the idea of this being a franchise. Yeah, I think this game stands on its own because of the developer. Um, this game was developed by Inti Creates, who has yeah, worked that's on... That's definitely part of why this game is so good, because Inti Creates really knows how to do retro platformers. This right. is a pattern that some people might have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they got a good game out of Mighty Number no. 9, even though they, yeah, they worked on the original Mighty Number no. 9, yeah. but uh, nobody blames them for the problems with um, Mighty Number no. 9. I mean, they did Mighty Gunvolt, and that came out fine. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's like I think this game does stand alone um, just because of the developer. Like, And it's worth to keep that in mind because Indie Creates is not on the main game. Um, it's being developed they, by... Yeah, they were initially, but it got shifted over to 505, I want to say. No, 505 is the publisher, oh. um, and the developers are Artplay and, like, Doko. Like, hmm. like art play is I think the uh, like the production company like or that that is the company that Iga is actually working at. Hmm. They are credited. I was about to say which one of those is Iga's. Yeah, and like <laughs> Doko is like the actual developer, but um, here this was done by Art Play and Inti Creates. So whatever uh, ritual of the night ends up being it's going to be very very different than what we got here for a whole host of reasons though the latest demo of that has been better than the first demo was i think most people agree right i'm just saying um not only do we have different developers we've got different aesthetics different focuses um mm -hmm. what have you like th this game is very deliberately aping castlevania 3. um which, you know, you go to the Castlevanias, Castlevania 3 and Castlevania Symphony of the Night are two very, very different Castlevania games. Yeah, and so, about, speaking of Symphony of the Night, Ritual of the Moon is going to be aping that one. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right, so, um, any last words? I'm enjoying it. <laughs> if you want a retro experience, go for it. <laughs> All right, then. Um, so be sure to tune in after the break as we review Red Faction Guerrilla Remastered. <laughs> Still hurts every time. Oh, yeah. That's not getting better. <laughs> 